Hi. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm a postdoc at the Arctic Institute, and we're very happy to host General Lawson this evening. Uh, General Lawson was a pilot, former chief of defense. And I've totally forgotten. <laughs> And he's, he, and he's here to speak to you this evening about Arctic sovereignty, Canadian Arctic sovereignty. So thank you. Thanks very much, Matt. Great. <laughs> well, thanks very much, uh, Matt and, uh, and Patty, for the invitation, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, for coming. Uh, here we are in the middle of a uh, university bar feeling really young again, aren't we? Uh, I'm delighted to be here, uh, not only because I've got a bunch of friends here at the University of Calgary, but because you know, spending 40 years as a military guy, you feel a little bit like a nomad in your own country. I had three postings to Alberta uh, during my fighter period. Uh, it was cold lake, mind you, but uh, got a sense of what this province is like. And, and I, I, just, I just love it. I love the resilience that's shown here. You're taking some hits right now. Uh, and uh, there's no whimpering. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, anger. That's good Albertan anger, uh, but there's no whimpering, and, uh, and, and that's why I love this province. Uh, I, I got a picture up here of another uh, a famous Calgarian, uh, used to be our prime minister. Uh, that's a shot of up at uh, us a, a couple of years ago up at Joe Haven on King William's Island. Uh, you know, he calls himself a Calgarian. I actually know he grew up about three streets over from me in Etobicoke. Every time I had a chance to introduce him in Toronto at whatever military thing he would show up at, I'd introduce him as a Toronto boy, and I'd get that patented uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, glare back, and afterwards he'd say, Calgarian, I'm a Calgarian. So there you go, another nomad who claims this as his province. So ladies and gentlemen, delighted to be here. As I say, want to talk to you this evening about Canadian Arctic sovereignty, I talk about being there, but that's tough, isn't it? It's tough to be in the Arctic. Uh, it's gonna be, seem like a really simple question, but how many of you would have spent some time in the Arctic at some point in your uh, life? So probably about half of you, those of you who have been there, uh, had your hands up, how many of you went in the dead of winter? Well, now that's impressive. That's really impressive because if you're on the ground anywhere in the Arctic in the dead of winter, you will know that survival is what it's all about. Actual sovereignty of this place, you couldn't care at all. In the summer, maybe it's uh, something else, but let's just talk about this concept of sovereignty. You know, what, what is it? How does one demonstrate it to those who are given the authority to deem that you have sovereignty? And then once you're given sovereignty, how set is it and how do you defend it? This concept, we won't take too much time on this, but if we back up to that, this concept of sovereignty, which seems so regular and normal to everybody sitting in this room, actually was kind of a new idea after the 30 years war in 1648. The idea being, look guys, we gotta stop fighting over chunks of land. So let's take our maps as we see them in Europe right now and come up with this Westphalian concept of drawing lines, once we've agreed on those lines, whoever the sovereign is in there, the emperor, the monarch, the elected official, will have this idea of authority to govern without interference. It can be hard on your people, you can demand massive taxes, you can be friendly to your people, whatever you want, you can take whatever risks you want, but you are sovereign over that area. And this kind of emanates from the 1600s. I would think most of the First Nations peoples who were in Canada would like a redo when they meet up with whatever Westerner was marching on the ter their traditional territories and said, who owns this land? And they looked with some confusion like a beagle looking at that, uh, the owner saying, who owns the land? Well, we, we draw from the land to survive on this land, but nobody owns the land. They'd probably like a redo on that and say, we own this land quite clearly. Uh, and then they could approach it from that point of view. How does one demonstrate it to those who, especially here in 2019, but over the years have deemed themselves the authorities on where you draw those borders? Well, it helps to have discovered the land, whether or not there were indigenous people on it. If there weren't any Westerners, the land hadn't been discovered, had it? 
to say that firmly with tongue in cheek. Uh, but if you've discovered this land and you've poked a flag into it, it's the first to, to all of those things which will add to your claim. The others will all have to do with control and what kind of control you've uh, been able to wield, and then influence. Once given authority to govern and the sovereignty that comes with it, how do you defend it? And probably the best way to defend it is to have people holding your passport living there. Well, the Canadian Arctic, everybody who had their hands up and all the rest of you who have flown over the Arctic know that that's going to be a challenge, isn't it? Not many Canadians live in the Canadian Arctic. So if you can't be there, getting there rather rapidly is a really good idea. And for that, Canadians are going to look to chronically underfunded organizations like the one I used to command, the Canadian Armed Forces or the Canadian Coast Guard. Now, I say that not whining because I'm, I'm an Albertan uh, at heart. I say that because Canada has typically taken a pretty severe discount on defense, and there are reasons for that that have to do with sovereignty. We're going to talk about that a little bit. If you can't be there and it takes you a long time to get there, the other way to defend your sovereignty is sensing there. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. OK, for the concept of sovereignty, let's move ahead and see what we can do with it now. So there's the map that we're going to use. We see we even have the Royal Tyrell Museum on there. and We've got the uh, Parliament bu buildings near Ottawa. If you can see it, we've got a whole bunch of the Arctic archipelago, the two main islands here, Baffin Island, Ellesmere Island, coming over to, to Victoria and Banks in the west. And then, of course, we've got the mainland. Let's define, for tonight's purposes, everything north of 60 as being Arctic territory. We OK with that? All right. Now, when you look at this, you will probably agree with me, any of you who have thought strategically, and you probably wouldn't, have, wouldn't be here tonight if you hadn't spent some time in your life thinking strategically, that although we might not be blessed with the best meteorological conditions, in terms of sovereignty, you couldn't be given a much more preferable geography. Would you go along with that? I mean, my army friends, I'm Air Force, but my army friends would say that we've got thousands of miles of tank trap off, off the west coast called the Pacific Ocean. We've got thousands of miles of tank trap off the east coast. There's the Atlantic. And then off the north, we've got all kinds of salt water, the Arctic Ocean. And then you might even be able to submit in a debate that our other borders, the one along with Alaska and then the 49th parallel, are even as secure as those borders that are lapped by salt water. All right. So this makes us a different people than most people in the world for whom the discussion of sovereignty is not academic like it will be for much of tonight. It's real and it's existential. If this was a room filled with Israelis, with an Israeli speaker up front, they're talking sovereignty. They're not talking about nice little issues. They're talking about which border is most under threat today. And they're one of probably 50, 60 nations who have either challenged borders or borders that will be crossed within the next year by people who don't hold passports. So if we're not the least threatened nation by way of sovereignty, we're going to be on a really short list of the lesser threatened. But that there holds within it a trap. Because if you don't have to invest in armed forces with the idea of protecting your own sovereignty, you are going to take a discount on defense. And every government, probably since the last real threats to our borders, which would have come from expansionist United States, and that probably ended, what would you say, in the 1850s, 1860s, the last presidents that we see who looked to the north thinking of the 51st state, or in those days, whatever number it was. That's all over. They've got all the problems they need. Till 1950, when we recognize the Soviets can probably muster enough aerospace power to come over the north, we're entirely unthreatened, aren't we, in that? All right, good. So we've got this preferable geography. We've had threats that led to the War of 1812. And then we had uh, Fenian raids, didn't we? And, and the British helped us uh, build the forts like Fort Henry. And we've got a bunch of those still sticking around and uh, uh, buying all kinds of tourism these days. 
largely that's over. How about the Arctic? We were just talking, Matt and I were talking about this Arctic sovereignty. We feel it's kind of in the pocket right now for some of the reasons we're talking about, but this may not actually hold for much longer in several ways. Let's talk about why. What's our claim to Arctic sovereignty based on? Some of you have studied these things. Anybody know this guy? There's a free beer in it that Patty's going to pay for if you can tell me who this guy is. Uh, yeah. Well, it, he's probably related to Prince Charles. This fell is about 10 mar uh, monarchs before our current monarch. This is Charles II called the Merry Monarch. This guy, and you, when you look at the picture, macho in kind of a 1600s way, right? Not the haircut anybody in here has right now. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's right. He's wearing kind of faux armor there. He's got his left hand on a sword saying, look, I'm, I'm a dude who can use violence if I have to use violence. And then he's got his hand on a staff that draws the viewer's eyes towards the fact that he's got a Royal Navy that can head out from his little island and create influence anywhere in the world if he wants to. And that's Charles II. So now Charles II, you may also know that he spent a good part of his young life fighting with Oliver Cromwell and losing to Oliver Cromwell and the Brits start their uh, experiment, seven year experiment with republicanism, which kind of fails. It was getting going and it failed, uh, happily, unhappily, we don't really know. They invite Charles back from, uh, from France where he's uh, weathering the storm. He comes back to great acclaim, sets up in London and spends 25 years uh, as probably the most loved monarch, maybe until Queen Victoria, maybe till our own uh, monarch, Queen Elizabeth. His courtiers come to him and you say, well, look, you got to understand, Charles, that in the time that you've departed, we've found new lands and it's been claimed on your behalf. And some of this is in the Arctic in the New World. He said, OK, well, what's there? They said, furs, furs, and we love furs. He said, all right, well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to set up a company over there that's going to cover all of what you're calling Rupert's land, all of the Hudson drainage. And we're going to give a charter to the Hudson's Bay Company. And what they're going to do is they're going to either pay massive taxes to me or they're going to bring furs back to me and courtiers and anything that's left over can go to the markets. And this is what he does. And it sounds like it's not important. It is important. Why? Because in 1670, there's a paper trail saying that Charles grants this charter to the Hudson's Bay Company. Anybody watch this CBC series called Frontier? Yeah. Isn't that something? The Hudson's Bay Company Lord is like a monarch in his own right. You do not mess with that guy. For about 200 years, now they're a store that sells us blankets that we all buy. But in 1870, the Canadian Dominion is setting up, and this starts to get kind of awkward. Because as you know, none of the Canadian Arctic was included in this new dominion. There's four provinces, but only the lower half of what we now know as Ontario and Quebec couple of provinces uh, in the Maritimes, and that's Canada. So uh, Sir John A. kind of looks across to England and says, what, what's your intention with the Arctic? They say, well, you know, we're kind of getting out of that business. There's not as many furs coming our way from there. What we'll do is we'll have the Hudson's Bay Company transfer title to Canada. And they do. And there's a paper trail. And this will matter. So really, there were no international questions for the Arctic mainland, all right? So for the time being, even then, and through till today, the mainland, pretty firm. What about that part that we now know as the Arctic archipelago? Not so much. As early as the 1570s, we see Martin Frobisher heading in towards lower Baffin Island, heading into Hudson's Bay, and some uh, intrepid explorers uh, like Davis and other Englanders are coming across, and uh, some whalers later on are, are spending some time in these areas. So that gives England a leg up for some portions of the Eastern archipelago. Here's the awkward thing. A bunch of Scandinavians are doing the same thing in other areas. A bunch of Americans uh, with a whole bunch of time on their hands are showing some pretty intrepid skills in doing the same thing. And that's awkward because they could be claiming parts of this for their countries too. And in fact, some are. Let's talk about that. So Sir John A. and his team are not feeling all that good about the claim to the Arctic. So in 1880, Britain says, look, 
We're going to seal the deal for you. You'll have no problems anymore. We're going to transfer all of our Arctic possessions to Canada. Now, I'm a pilot, a simple pilot, and an engineer. Not a legal dude, but we got a couple of legal dudes, at least in the crowd. When this codicil gets added, tell me if this is going to stand up, Bob Booth. It says, we're going to give you all our Arctic possessions, including the islands adjacent to those that we know of, whether discovered or not. Kind of shaky, little dubious since some have not yet been discovered and you're passing title for those to Canada and others unfortunately have been discovered and have flags that don't look like the Canadian flag of 1870, right? So in 1895, we've got a paper trail. Brit's trying to help us out a little bit more. Thank you very much, Matt. The Colonial Boundaries Act, but it's still vague. Still, however, relatively unchallenged, because who but a few are interested in this icy land? So there were no formal claims at this time, but the U.S. is really active around Ellesmere Island. We've got Adolphus Greeley spending a whole lot of time up there doing some incredible things uh, with American assets. Then we've got Robert Peary. Everybody knows about Robert Peary in 1909. He might have got to the North Pole. Vote if you think he went to the North Pole. Probably not. But one thing's for sure, he spent a lot of time marching around Greenland and Ellesmere Island. That dude spent a lot of time in the north. There weren't a lot of Canadians spending that much time up north. All right, this is a personal hero of mine. Anybody know it? This one's not for beer, because I think you might know. Who's that? That's Otto Sverdrup. This guy, yeah, there were a whole, it was on your lips. You just didn't want to say it. This guy is an um, Arctic monster. He is a hero of mine the same way Ernest Shackleton is a hero. Remember what Ernest Shackleton did when he probably should have died with his entire crew after getting away from Antarctica, but he actually shows up, doesn't lose a crew member? This guy had the same massive charisma to lead men when they have to winter stuck in ice. If you can do that, man, we need you in the Canadian Armed Forces. That's leadership. I would follow this guy anywhere. Otto Sverdrup comes from Norway. That's the problem. He's not Canadian. His 14 years of Arctic activity, most, mostly in this ship, the Fram, and the Fram's often stuck in ice. A lot of you are nodding. A lot of you studied this guy. The problem is he was doing a lot of stuff up in the Arctic that we would like to declare Canadian. Axel Heiberg Island and the two Ringness Islands, Elif and Amund uh, Ringness Island, he and his team are probably the first homo sapiens ever to step on those three islands. We're talking Inuit too. There's nothing up there. There's no rabbits to cook. Might be some polar bears occasionally. I don't know. Uh, maybe not. But there's Ellesmere Island just to the east. Here are three islands that nobody who was exploring Ellesmere was ever getting to. This guy was, and he had a map maker with him and one of the finest in the world. And they made maps of these three islands that could not be disputed. This is Sverdrup's land, and he sticks a pole in there with a Norwegian flag. And Norway feels they've got a pretty good claim in 1888 or 1902 or whenever it was it gets stuck in. So Canada's going, all right, look, in the 1880s, we've got some Canadians voyaging largely from Newfoundland and the East Coast into the Eastern Arctic. Baffin Island largely, and in 1897, we stick a Canadian flag in there and say, there, Baffin Island, at least that's ours. Up to Ellesmere Island in 1904, and we do some of this charting and claiming, and then Melville Island, we do some more claiming, and other parts of the Eastern Arctic Archipelago, and then in 1913, through the First World War, there's a few claims made for Canada in the Western portion of the Arctic. These are all good. These are all good. But like we talked about when we were discussing the concept of sovereignty, sticking a flag into the territory is only step one in having these world authorities decide that you've got sovereignty over it. All right, well, that's not all we did. But the US and the Danes are saying, well, wait a minute now. You've got no effective Canadian occupation up there. We've been there. You've got no administration up there. And in 1919, when thousands of soldiers are coming back to North America and Europe who, sh who know they should have died on the front, 
at the rest of their life is gravy. These guys take unbelievable risks, and a whole bunch of them are adventurers. They head up into the north, and the US and Danish explorers completely ignore Canadian claims of sovereignty. And they're doing all kinds of things up there. In fact, the Danes are on Ellesmere Island all the time. It's right across the street from, uh, from Greenland. And they're basically ignoring Canadians. They, they say, Ellesmere Island, you got to be kidding, Canadian, that's no man's land. And the Americans say, let's step back a bit. Why is it can Canadian? Why? What do you have? So Canada knows they've got to up their game. Now we're talking. Canada start as early as 1903, the Northwest Mounted Police were setting up some uh, posts in the Arctic, in the mainland. So between 1920 and 1930, some money is gathered up, and now it's no longer the Northwest Mounted Police, it's the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and they start establishing posts on those islands you can see, Baffin, Ellesmere, Devon Islands. They didn't just send a couple of constables to sit in a shack around a fireplace, these dudes were monsters too. Together with Inuit guides, they set up sled dog teams and they went thousands of kilometers over the islands that they were assigned to. They were exploring, they were mapping, and every time they came to an Inuit camp, they wouldn't just wave and go by, they'd take out their census book and take down names. Why? Because one of the things that establishes sovereignty is demonstrating control through census taking. You rip that page off, you send it down to Ottawa, we have records of who is where. This is control. And here's kind of a sly move. In 1926, the Back Peninsula, anybody been there? Yeah, Eastern Baffin Island, they set up a post office. First post office in the Arctic Archipelago. Why? It's not like there was a shopper's drug mark there serving a lot of people. The Bach Peninsula was probably the easiest place and the most southern place on Baffin Island. You could set up a post office and having postal service once a year, mind you, and probably only one or two letters to the constables who are staying there. That is another clear demonstration of control and influence in the area. So we're getting pretty smart at this game. We're starting to set up something we can do. We still got this Norwegian claim and this one's really bothersome. Any Norwegians in here, Norwegian background? You meet a Norwegian, you love a Norwegian. These guys are great. And like really good sports, in 1930, they've kind of been pushing what Otto Sverdrup did. He's a hero to them too. And they've got ever they got all those maps. They're staking claim to at least these three islands and maybe a bit more. And then their government says, uh, what are we doing? That is so hard to get to. There are no flights. You know, what Sverdrup did with all his team getting there we can't exert control, we are withdrawing our claim. Canada sees this as an opening. We head over there and we actually meet up with Otto Sverdrup, who's an old man by this time, and we buy his explore, exploration journals. We buy them from him, we pay him a fair price. 60,000 in 1930 dollars, I used a little calculator, uh, the conversion calculator, it's a million dollars by today's standards. Sverdrup dies two weeks later, but his family is delighted with the deal he made. Uh, and by the way, all of those maps and uh, journals are all back in Norway now. If you travel to Oslo, you can see them in one of the many museums there. So everybody's really fair here, but most importantly, Norway has withdrawn their claim. So there's the last part of the uh, Arctic Archipelago. The game keeps getting upped up there, small bit by bit, but in the 1950s, our grandparents, I'm looking at some of the young people in here, maybe your great-grandparents, did something remarkable. They built the distance early warning line. You'll see in the little map over there, that's the one up on the north. About 60 or 70 stations belonging to this uh, dew line, the idea being to shove a whole lot of energy up north because we need early warning if the Russians are going to come across carrying nuclear weapons. We need to know that and be able to intercept them before they get, well, they're going to get deep into Canada, but they're not going to do a whole lot of damage there. Before they get to southern Canada, well, the Americans probably didn't care too much about that. Northeastern United States, now we're talking. That's really, really important. So within a few years, 
Americans and Canadians, our grandparents, great grandparents, dig out these 60 or 70 sites, man them up with the latest technology, and we are pouring energy up over the North Pole. Please. Both Canadian and American. Now, 90% paid for by the United States. This deal, what we did was we gave up access to sovereignty, aerospace sovereignty, which we knew the Americans would probably take if it was an existential threat anyway. At least we said, you can, because we're going to uh, sign an agreement with you called the NORAD Agreement. I got to be deputy, com or deputy commander of that a few years later, well, quite a few years later. Uh, and uh, for that, the Americans said, we're going to pay for just about everything that we put up there, and they continue with that deal to today. This gets upgraded in 1988 so that uh, men and women are not needed to man most of those sites, and they upgrade the technology so even more energy is being pushed up over the north. But if you think you can sleep tight because our Arctic archipelago is well alarmed over there, eh, eh, eh. it's like Canada is a massive home that we've got alarmed except for the three back bedrooms where our daughters are. There's nothing looking far up into the archipelago we can't see. Now you would say, well, satellites. Ladies and gentlemen, anybody who knows satellite technology knows very little energy comes off a satellite. They're amazing things, but it's like looking through a straw, right? Over the course of weeks or a month, you can get a full map that looks like it was a picture was taken yesterday afternoon. But it took all kinds of passes and all back and forth to just look at where the ice is. There's so little energy coming down that you'll never be able to track anybody or set up anything that is going to monitor aviation assets coming towards us. It's going to be some sort of north warning system that's going to continue to provide us that access. And it's got to be updated again because we're already talking nearly uh, 30 years right there since the last update. So is it going to be pushed further up north? Probably should be. All right, good. So present day, let's jump to the claim to the land mass is reasonably secure. Both the mainland and the Arctic archipelago, the claim to the channels and straits, especially those things we would call the Northwest passages, eh, not so much. Canada and some friendly nations who need something from us are saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Internal waters, just like the St. Lawrence and, uh, and the Great Lakes. And we go, we love you. Others, most, are saying, uh, 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 when that ice, even when the ice is just getting choppy, but when the ice disappears, just like the Malacca Straits, my cold Canadian friends, those are open international waters. Here's the map that we would like to, uh, uh, like the, the entire world. If you can kind of look there, do you see we've got the entire archipelago here? All we've done is we've drawn this purple line from tip to tip on all the islands, right to the tip of Ellesmere Island, down the right-hand side of uh, Baffin Island, drawn the uh, exclusive economic zone outside of that, and said, there you go. Now, I would think that anybody anywhere in the world who requests this map will get it delivered to them for free, because we would like this map to propagate around the world, because most of the world looks at it this way. It's open, and as it opens and as it becomes more and more important, because I think you can cut off, I've heard, eight, ten days, two weeks off of a freighter going from Europe to Asia, or more importantly, from Asia to Europe, or well, more importantly for China anyway. Using that, there is going to be a huge payoff if it's agreed by those international authorities that this is international water space. Please. And the more traffic can put through those waters, I would think, defeats our argument more and more than internal waters. So far, exactly. And Canada's picked that up because this traffic is increasing, as you say. All of it is getting permission or at least giving notice to Canadian authorities. Now, I, did, uh, I didn't mention it, but the Americans tested this back in 1969 with the Manhattan. And they lost nerve just a little bit. They said, no, 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 we're going to head through. That's international waterway. And we said, it isn't, you know. And they said, yeah, it is. We said, no, it's not. And they said, well, and they were coming up with plans. They weren't going to tell us. And then someone made a decision and said, you know what, those are friends. And they said, we would like to invite 
Coast Guard authorities, other government authorities, as you would like, to transit with the Manhattan in 1969 as it passes through there. And we said, that constitutes a request to pass through our water. They said, not really, it's just an invitation. They said, that's good enough for us. We both looked different ways, and we continue to work ahead in friendly style, us thinking that we own those as internal waterways. And this continues through to today. It's not established. We've got another sovereignty challenge. Anybody with Danish background? Holy smokes. Now, this is a war we might be able to win. I don't know. I'm, not, I'm actually not even sure of that. But there's Hans Island on the right. That's a, to give you a bit of an idea. It's about a kilometer and a half of square territory, beautiful beachfront territory, as you can see. If you put a dock down to the south there, you'll be a long walk down to get to it. There's no doubt about it in your flip-flops in the morning. But it didn't really matter. It's right up here between Greenland and Ellesmere Island. Nobody really cared, and then the Danes got kind of frisky, and as they sailed by, sorry, you break that out a little bit, it's right on the international border between Greenland waters, which is a Danish protectorate, and Canadian waters, like right on the border. So in about 2004, the Danes, in their frisky style, landed a helicopter on there, built a cairn, and toasted Danish ownership of Hans Island. Well, them's fighting words, right? Because... We want that island, and we want it to be Canadian. It's important. So we flew a helicopter on, and we drank our own Schliebewitz to this, or whatever the Canadian uh, growth is for that, and, and we built another cairn up there, and we have not met the Danes on Hans Island, but it's gone quiet for about 10 years. Remember, it, it actually was on the front page for a little while, and people weren't smiling. You may have been, but there were people looking at the bigger issue. This one's got dormant. I never declared war on my Danish compatriots, and I don't think John Vance is going to. We're probably going to be okay with this one. But we do have a really important uh, claim to sort out. That's this Beaufort Sea claim. Now, that's if over here on the right-hand side of the Alaskan uh, landmass, right where it touches the Yukon, you see a blue line. And it's got just a slight western tilt to north, right? So the Canadians say, come here, my American friend. Walk with me to the end. Keep the compass going. Keep your heading going. Look out to sea. And that slightly canted line, as far as the economic exclusion zone, is the border. Everything there is yours, and everything there is ours. Right? Good. So let's go home. No. Oh, just a minute, my cold Canadian friend. We actually don't see it that way. We like that old custom where you come to the border, whatever it is, like between Alaska and Yukon. And what you do is you stand with one foot on each part, portion of the shore, kind of 90 degrees, and look out. And you see that gives kind of a northeastern tilt to the extension off the land. Out to the ex uh, economic exclusion zone, you've got this cross-hatched area which is under dispute. Now, why does it matter? There's all kinds of oil and gas under there. And if I understand, it's fairly shallow. So we're not going to win that one, but we're also not going to go to war. And we hope the Americans won't win that one. We'd like to share the profits if there are profits to be gained. Anybody got an update on that little uh, claim right there? All right, we'll leave it that way then. This idea of being up there, however, is important. Being up there means, as you would know for the inter international waterways, that you've got to have some capability to break ice up there. Here's bad news. The Royal Canadian Navy does not. If the ice is broken, we can go through little bits of it and uh, repaint the hull later on. We may not sink. Uh, the Canadian Coast Guard has 15 icebreakers. 13 of them don't want to mess around in Arctic waters. Uh, too much, especially we've got two heavy ones. We've got the Louis Saint Laurent and we've got the Terry Fox. The first one's nearly 50 years old, second one's 35 years old. Anybody been on board these things? You have. It was ready to crap out, yeah. Two years ago, it was a Louis Saint There you go, the Louis Saint Laurent. So you've seen what it's like. These things are massively expensive, massively expensive. In 1985, the Conservative government, who are the ones who often announce investment in the chronically underfunded. Uh, military, said, Joe Clark was the fellow who announced it, Canadian government's going to spend $500 million $1985 for a world-class heavy icebreaker. And that hung around for a couple of years before it got cancelled, so that's pretty good. 
Then the same government said, ah, that icebreaker, that's pretty expensive. That's $500 million $85. Think a billion and a half. Now, who's building these things? Russia, China. China. China doesn't even own any Arctic. That's odd. Yeah. All right, 1987, there's a plan comes in to build nuclear subs because if you want to establish being there, nuclear subs. Now, there aren't too many countries have these things. If you think metal and you think salt water, think money. It's really expensive. You think an F-35 is expensive, that just touches air. If it touches salt water, you've got to put a lot of money into it. So that gets canceled. 1996, another plan comes out, this time by the Liberals, and they say, well, okay, not nuclear subs, but some sort of sub that can travel around. Diesel it has to breathe every once in a while, so you gotta be careful, but it'll patrol in the Arctic. How about that? And that's abandoned about a year later. So you, you get a bit of a sense of a theme here. All right, finally, 2007, Prime Minister Harper says, okay, this, we gotta do something with the Arctic. You know, this was kind of a favorite of his. Remember every summer he would head up into the Arctic, right? So he says the port at Nanasivik on Baffin Island, we're going to turn that into a world-class port. We're going to put the money into it that needs to be put into it to be a world-class port. Not so much. In 2012, that was scaled back. However, here in 2019, anybody been to Nanasivik? There you go. It has turned into at least a touch point for ships that are going to head there, like these ships that have come to fruition. A round of applause. Canada announces back in 2010 that we're going to get, the Royal Canadian Navy is going to get six to eight of these Arctic offshore patrol ships, and they can bump into little bits of ice and keep on moving. The first one sailed last summer. Five, six, or seven more on the way. And this brings the Royal Canadian Navy into the game of going into the southern Arctic ice fields. All right, and that's important. Demonstrating sovereignty uh, can happen in another way. I gotta mention Canadian Forces Station Alert. Anybody been to Alert? Alert is the most northerly permanent settlement in the world. It's only been permanent since 1950 with about 200 Canadians, but right there on the very tip of Ellesmere Island, you'll see Alert. It was a really secret spy post up there. Now it's kind of 30 or 40 uh, weather people uh, and not a whole lot else going on up there. Uh, however, I've been there. When you go there, where do you find the North Star? Right overhead. Right overhead. I mean, it, it really isn't. You've still got eight more degrees uh, to go, seven and a half degrees to go, but it feels like it's right there. My son flies uh, Hercules aircraft, was there just last week, uh, bringing new lettuce to these guys up there in alert. That matters, ladies and gentlemen, that matters. Those authorities will look at that and say that's worth something. But 40,000 islands in the Arctic archipelago, all those who put their hand up that went up there, we'll see some tiny islands. How many of these have people on them? Six. Now, Baffin Island has a few settlements. The largest is Iqaluit. A bunch of you have been to Iqaluit. I know that. That's a city. That's a full-up city up there. They, they had their supplies all burned in, in July. It's going to be either a hungry or a very expensive winter coming up, but, uh, but they've got a real city in Iqaluit with an international airport. On Victoria Island, we got Cambridge Bay. A bunch of you have been there. It's a lovely place. King William Island, Joa, Joa Haven, a lot of happy uh, Inuit there. Southampton Island, we've got Coral Harbor. But then Ellesmere Island, we've got Grease Fjord, 130. We're down to 112 at Sachs Harbor on Banks Island, the, up in the archipelago. Those numbers aren't going to increase by a lot. There's not going to be a lot of economy drawing more people up there at, unless you're harvesting oil and gas up there. <clears throat> However, those who are there uh, really do have some say. The Canadian Rangers, this is a, a tremendous program. It is the Canadian Armed Forces Authority in the North. All these dudes know how to shoot. We gave them rifles from World War I that they love because they never ever succumb to the cold. So we bought them these new rifles and they said, can we keep the old ones? We went, yeah. They said, we, we, we like those too. Canadian Junior Rangers, fantastic program as well. You can't buy enough of those hoodies to keep the kids going in this program. But that's the few people that are up north. It matters, but there just aren't many. Those people who have spent some time in the north know it's a little bit less 
When you're up in the north and facing the environment, it's a little bit less about what passport you've got in your pocket and a little bit more about homo sapiens versus the environment, isn't it? Really. And happily, and in kind of a heartening sense, when you put the sovereignty questions aside for a little while, it's amazing how we've seen the, largely the eight Arctic nations come together to do things like in 1991, put in place this Arctic environmental protection strategy. And they didn't just do it as eight nations, they brought the indigenous peoples and observer states in and said, look, there's some really important things happening up north there. What can we be doing together? From that, you uh, all know about the Arctic Council. It includes those eight Arctic nations, and they're into really tough things like sustainable development because they know there's got to be some development, especially of the oil and gas up there, climate change is having this massive effect, and then Arctic shipping, as we've talked about, uh, and cruise ships, and I went on one of those, and it's a great place to go to. Please. Uh, Poland is not part of the Arctic Council. Okay. Uh, now, if they're an observer state, they would have picked up that in, in recent years. So I think that would be an important sovereignty question for them, wouldn't it? Yeah. All right, good. I uh, happen to be part, uh, I, I was uh, chair of the uh, Canadian a delegation that negotiated for two years, 2011, 2012, an Arctic Search and Rescue Treaty. Now it's heartening that we came up with something, I'm gonna show you the map, but you adventurers who are gonna go up there, the idea of search and rescue, you better take enough equipment when you go overboard to float warmly for at least 24 hours because the very best of these nations who have divided up the north will not be getting to you for a day. We'll get to you maybe overhead. We might drop something to you. You can climb up like those uh, native uh, um, fishermen, seal hunters did in, out of Igloolik uh, a couple of years ago at the loss of one of our jumpers, uh, mind you. Um, this is a heartening idea of how we can group together as humanoids, as homo sapiens, with the idea of matching what the meteorology up there uh, can face humans. But there are threats developing, at least comp competitive threats, oil, gas, and resources, shipping, cruise lines. If my friend Rob Hubert were here, he would not let me get out of here without saying there is also military threat up there. Here's, there's truth to that. The Russians have opened up Arctic airfields that were closed at the end of the Cold War. They've reopened them, they've refurbished their bear bombers, uh, their backfire bombers, They've got refuelers and they're carrying out some really significant, difficult Arctic expeditions in the air that's approaching, frequently approaching Canadian and American airspace. <clears throat> Rob would tell you that that's just the start of potential hostilities in the future. I'm not convinced as your chief of defense uh, that there's any intent there. I think the intent there is to show that they can do it Rob would be here putting his hand up right now and saying, okay, my friend, you're a little too optimistic. Let's sum up, please. Uh, have you, uh, have we still got FOLs that uh, uh, Rankin? Yes. So the three are operational, Rankin, Metallowitz, Delvin. Yes, okay. yeah, we do. And the fighters uh, exercise out of there. Uh, but recognize that you've got to have really early warning to get fighters in place to actually intercept uh, as far out as we would like to intercept them. Defending Arctic sovereignty going forward is not gonna be a lot more about being there. It's gonna continue to be about getting there with fighters and with ships, but it's gonna be about sensing there. That's the future. And all domain awareness that shows you're listening, you're watching, and you can get there as required. How are you gonna do it? Well, here's the problem. You think there must be a ton of satellites sitting in place over the north. Anybody know a little bit about uh, satellite uh, orbit physics? You actually can't park one over the north. It becomes really clear why after a little while with our Earth spinning around the pole, the only place you can park a satellite is over the equator. And there are literally thousands of satellites parked over the equator. 
because it's really expensive to get these things out there. And once they're out there, you want to sell their capability to millions of people. And to sell it to millions of people, it's got to stay in one spot. You point your little dish towards it, it pumps as much power as you can, and you get Netflix. You can't do that in the north. What you can do is you can fly a satellite over that may spend an hour if it's in low Earth orbit, a couple hours if it's in medium Earth orbit, or if it's in a highly elliptical orbit, it can rocket really close to the, the South Pole and then go into a high orbit that looks for a while like it's idle over the North Pole. It's not. It's going thousands of kilometers out in space and then falling down the other side. But for a little while, it's there for you. What we really need is a constellation of these satellites, and there is only largely one constellation out there providing real-time uh, satellite communication. Anybody know that company? Iridium. They're the only ones that have actually monetized this, and one company went out of business doing it. Well, the future has got to be a constellation of satellites. Who's picked this up? The Russians have picked it up. There's their Artika M, and that is a big satellite, and they've got a bunch of them. The first one goes up in June of this year. <clears throat> this is going to provide communications. It's going to provide controls for drones. It's going to provide sensing that they need. They're putting their money where their mouth is, and we're going to get into a partnership with the states for other satellite constellations up there, uh, but this is being done. Satellite surveys and reconnaissance communications. What about underwater? We've talked about going up. Let's go down for a little bit. If you really want to know, as those straits are opening up, these international straits, you've got to have some, somebody listening to those waters, which largely means having microphones sitting on the bottom of these waterways, taking in the sounds, feed it, feeding it into computers, making it all through artificial intelligence, and then calling the right person when it hears something of note that needs to be looked at, right? So this is coming. And there's experimentation right now with an un unmanned underwater vehicle like that. It's metal touching salt water. What do we know about that? It's really expensive. But it's not nearly as expensive because there's no men and women inside. So this is going to be like anybody got the, one of those round vacuums that goes around your, your house? Yeah. And, and when it feels sad and tired, it it's head, heads into your bedroom and plugs in for a little while. And then when it feels good again, it heads back out and does that forever. So what you have is you have a fleet of these things doing the same thing, predicted or unpredicted with a bunch of home ports that it goes in, grabs more power, and then heads back out. You can do all kinds of things with that, can't you? You can have visual monitoring. You can have sound monitoring. You can tow arrays. You could arm these things if we were so inclined, but we're Canadians, so we probably won't. This is being experiment, experimented with right now. Aerospace monitoring and response. We talked a little bit about the fact that we've got to update the North Warning System and move it further north. We talked about the fact that satellites aren't going to help us with that, so it's going to be something big and heavy on the ground. But we also need something that's looking up there, right? Unmanned drones, the perfect idea. Unfortunately, unmanned drones don't work very well up north. You not only are working with temperatures that almost nothing can stand, but you were talking about winds that can come up, unpredicted massive winds that will down these things enormously, and then trying to get controls to them, or at least uh, uh, commands to them, you need a system of satellites. Who's figuring this out? The Russians. There's their drone called the Zala. Hey, it's built by a company called Kalashnikov. Anybody heard of that company? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they stayed in business after the First and Second World Wars. They're just getting into higher technology. And where will the commands come from from this thing? Maybe some of those Arctica uh, satellites up top. Russians are putting a little bit of money where their mouths are. Not trying to scare you. Just saying, I know you're not only interested in the Arctic, you're also voters. And there's going to be some discussion of how much Canadians put into defense. You're interested in the Arctic, maybe not so much about us heading over and fighting ISIS. Maybe you're interested in that too. But if you're interested in this, we're going to have to up our game from 0.8% GDP, not to 4% like the United States, not to 8% like Russia, uh, but maybe 1.5%. I mean, I'm not asking for a lot, ladies and gentlemen, but I was working with a budget of $20 billion in a country like Canada 
$20 billion probably what I would need to look after the sovereignty of the North and the rest of Canada, let alone keep the capabilities to take part with NATO and other coalitions around the world. Let's bump that to 30 million. Keep that figure in your mind. Kind of a percent and a half of GDP. So one last thing, there's this technology called tethered aerostat. These things are fantastic. They have enormous uh, use in the North. As things uh, get warmer up there, of course, you've got really mushy ground, really tough to use ice bridges and things like that up there. So what you have is you've got little guiding propellers on the back. This one's built by Lockheed Martin to carry a radar system, and it can carry it up to 15,000 feet on a tether, as long as it knows when the winds are coming. If you only want to carry a couple of thousand pounds of uh, construction equipment a mile away, this is a perfect type solution for that kind of uh, environment. Let's sum up, ladies and gentlemen. If you've got any energy left, we'll talk about whatever you'd like to talk about. Let's say this about Canadian Arctic sovereignty. We've got pretty sound claim to Arctic sovereignty on all land masses up there, mainland and islands. There will be those who will challenge it. We've probably got more paperwork and more evidence of control and administration and influence than any other nation for what's up there. We'll probably hold that. The waterways to be de determined. In terms of investments that will come, if we're serious about this, let's go from the very to the less expensive, a North Warning System upgrade. Think billions. Think five or six billion, and that's with American help. Heavy icebreakers. Think a billion and a half. We've already got a plan for one. We even know who's going to build it, right? It's going to be built on the West Coast by C-SPAN. C-SPAN, exactly. Uh, we just don't have a plan for it yet. <clears throat> Money for it, that's to come. Satellite constellation for both communications and reconnaissance and monitoring. It's probably next on your list. You can get constellations or, you know, what's a satellite? $300 million for a large one. Little cube satellites could be a lot less than that. Uh, we need constellations for those things. Underwater and aerospace monitoring, you can step into that as you will with drones and underwater drones. Put some money aside for those lawyers who we love so much as well, because we're going to need them fighting these good fights in the international courts uh, of the future as these other nations become more and more interested in what we know as the Canadian Arctic. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. That's what I've got for you. Delighted to take any questions that you might have. Please, sir. Just a clarification. In the 1930s, in the Corfu decision, the International Court came to that strait uh, between East and Albania as international because of the historic transit of commercial vessels. Okay, so what he's saying is at Corfu, a lot of international traffic had been traditionally going through there, right? So they're saying that was important because of history. Yeah. Up until the last few years, when vessels have now gone through what we call the Northwest Passage, up until that time, basically, no commercial vessels. Right. And that the Corfu decision strengthened the Canadian case. Now with the... Uh, transit of a number of vessels, some of which are accompanied, right. that, that aspect of the legal things begins to weaken. Okay. So you're hopeful that we would actually win well, this discussion? That's, that's on our side. That, that would be what the Canadian okay. legal people would probably argue. Right. right. Thank you for that. Good. Please, sir. Right. 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 So the Russian claim actually extends past the North Pole because of the Lomonosov Ridge that runs off uh, Russian territory. Now, I have an update that's as 
recent as my retirement as chief of defense when we had a conservative government in and we filed, uh, basically we filed a paper that say ridges run both ways. So as that ridge runs into Canada and you can identify it, it hasn't been as well mapped as the Russians have done, but it runs into Canada and the thought is that this ridge maintains its ridge-like nature right to Canadian territory. So my friend, it's like we're, we've got both holding on to ends of the rope. Why is it your rope? Uh, is there anybody would have an update on that discussion of the Lomonosov Ridge? Yeah, I, I can't answer that. Um, the mapping that's going on, subsurface mapping that's going on right now, and, and it is not complete in the north, as you know, wasn't it the academic IOFI? Uh, that went up on uh, on a rock about four years ago. Yeah, it was just last year. Uh, was this last year? Yeah, it was on a, yeah, we got today, that was on okay, good. And then another cruise ship a couple of years before. The captain, of course, takes responsibility, but he's using maps that have nothing there. Most of the mapping is being done with the idea of safety of watercraft heading through uh, these areas. Actual mapping of ridges with the idea of extending claims, I don't have information on. You might. No, different question. Sir, number, I'll be right to you. A number of years ago, there was an attempt to see on the Alpha Ridge to see how far that extended and see if that uh, extended into a Canadian claim. It didn't work quite out. Okay. All right. All right. So we'll see about that, ma'am. Um, yeah, so the question is, do I see the effects of climate now hindering the, uh, the development uh, up there? Uh, I would think the opposite. I, I would think that uh, as the ice filters out and we get more and more beachside property up there, uh, what's going to happen is we're going to have to get more and more serious about what rules are applied to those who would apply through there. I mean, it really is a part of the world that we would declare more sensitive than other parts of the world, largely because uh, there are uh, uh, fauna up there uh, that have not uh, been accustomed to man and require ice. Uh, but the use of uh, the land and resources up there, uh, I would think, uh, you, you know, should continue to take place inside a set of rules that are yet to be developed. For instance, um, the uh, cruise ships that are going up there right now, I don't think laws have been passed yet, but under discussion is that you will never, never travel with fewer than two cruise ships. The idea being if the front one runs into a rock ledge and search and rescue can't get to it in time, it will not be the, the responsibility of the nation that owns that part to now spend hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars getting up there. So a law like that would either make sure that safety is being taken care of uh, or that you uh, can do a buddy system. I think it's through very careful thought that the development can work out for everybody in a way that as this ascends into accessible area, all people can use it, uh, not only for resources, but for, uh, uh, for adventure uh, use and, and, and other forms of uh, industry. But I, you know, that's an opinion, really. That, that's no, not, nothing other than that. Yes. Still, still operational? Yes. Why, why do you think we still, we don't still have that? I, I don't know. Okay. I'm just saying the word. We didn't say the yeah. word. Yeah. Okay. So that doesn't leave this room. The camera wasn't on for that. <laughs> I don't know a thing. Nobody tells me anything. <laughs> My Polish friend. <laughs> You're not. <laughs> you just know something about Poland. Okay.
Very interesting. I've got nothing on that. Has anybody got an update uh, for a friend on that? Uh, you will know that, of course, the Russian portion of the Arctic Ocean uh, for much of the year is, is clear, much clearer, of course, than the way uh, the ice gets flung, which is deep into our international waterways, providing us an extra few years to work out whether or not they're internal or international, because as long as they're choked with ice, it becomes far more difficult to go through them. Not so much a problem the Russians have on their side of the Arctic Ocean, yeah. right? Right, right. No, no update on that. Uh, however, the, the track to Churchill is open again, so you can buy a ticket as required. Yeah. Please. Uh, I think one of our problems is well, we've been deep water ports like the Russian ports. I think there's one going in now in uh, Nikalovic that's being built. I think it's supposed to be operational in the summer, uh, which is the first in the of the Churchill. But, but uh, that's always been a concern. Yeah, what do we know? Uh, anybody got an update on the Callowit the, uh, port? Uh, of course, uh, Martin Frobisher was in there with, uh, with uh, yeah, a few years ago uh, with shallower keels than, than what we're uh, uh, interested in. However, um, just thinking of a Callowit and where it is, and the fact that there are only 6,000 um, in that town, the idea would be for ships to moor there uh, and offload for other ships to come in, pick up, and continue. Right. Got it. Okay. Please. Right, we know that, don't we? Tarbot Wars. Yeah. Um, so I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll step around the question a little bit and open it up on the floor. But the reason I'll step around it is being a military guy, um, I'm interested uh, mostly in the orders that I receive from my government. If it's interesting to my government, it's fascinating to me. Uh, and I want the capability to carry out whatever it is uh, that they want done. Uh, now, there's a certain amount we can do as an Air Force, can't we? We can overfly, and, and fisheries have been well supported by our Auroras, by uh, uh, Argus before that, long range patrol aircraft that largely, you know, have helped out with uh, drift net uh, in the Pacific and things like that. Uh, actually, being there on the spot requires sensing, doesn't it? It really does. It requires sensing to know who's doing it, because the stakes are high enough that. You'll fish against the law in areas where you know you can get away with it. So it's sensory. Once we know that, we need to be able to uh, at least file a complaint uh, legally, which is largely what we do. Uh, you know, we brought that one Spanish trawler in, which was a you know, and a, a round went across its bow. That was back in what 93, 94. Um, so I mean, we can get tough if we have to, uh, but the idea of actually in person, in Arctic waters, turning away a fishing boat seems unlikely. The cost of doing that, being there, seems unlikely. If we had armed drones that can put one across the bow, now we'd probably get the attention of a fishing captain. I think it's far more likely until we get really good sensing capabilities uh, that pirate fishermen will be able to take loads uh, that will be very difficult to look at. This is not too much different than large swaths of the Pacific uh, and large, uh, I would think, the Atlantic as well, although the Atlantic has a lot of uh, uh, traffic and not as much girth as the Pacific. 
That's a military answer, and I stepped around some of the other parts to it, uh, but I, I'm not sure. I think you bring up a very good point, and one of the good points you bring up is I didn't say a word about fish as being one of those things that will be very important up north. Well, you will know that the Chinese want to be an Arctic Council nation um, as their economy grows and, and they realize how important it is to have a, uh, a line of communication through the uh, Canadian Arctic, largely. Uh, they want to have a, uh, at least influence and be able to, uh, to decide. Um, their uh, very strategic view of the economy, probably the most strategic in the history of man as a country, you know, that, that um, what do we call it, the ring of, chain of pearls, ring of pearls. All their stations around the world meant for deep, deep water uh, shipping. Uh, and, you know, over the last decades, they've been working with countries that we wouldn't think of setting foot in for personal safety reasons. All show what they've been thinking about as this massive Chinese economy grows. They've had an eye on the Arctic, not in the last few years, but for many years. Some of their icebreakers are coming to fruition now with a lot more in shipyards, all with the idea that they will be able to get through the Antarctic if, as required, but the Canadian Arctic as required as well. So I think that's largely going to be who will come up with most of the counterclaims to Canadian Arctic sovereignty. Please. How do you see the, uh, the Americans react to this? Does that impact the idea of Yeah, well, I, on that, I would say the Americans can't really have it both ways. You know, if they argue in terms of international waterways, uh, th then they're going to have to be fine uh, with uh, China going through there. But now, now we're back um, to this lady's question, and that was that what will we and the Americans do to make sure it's done safely? And this will be through very careful uh, laws, shipping laws, safety laws, um, uh, awareness of who is where, when, abilities to save yourself in times of need, and things like that. You know, I was just thinking something popped into my mind. Another way the Americans could do it, of course, is come alongside Canada and say that those are internal waterways and then negotiate American access to our internal waterways as great friends that they were, that they are. <laughs> Was that a slip of the tongue? I'm sorry. Please, sir. That's reminiscent of the Cold War, when if it was, the Americans realized if it was declared international waters, that means the Soviets could use it. So the Soviet, so the Americans sort of let Canadians say what they do, probably said submarines from the passage and everything else, yep. but they wouldn't say publicly that this was international. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And that's probably the thinking in some of them, at least with regard to the Chinese yeah. right now. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm delighted. Uh, thank you very much for having me, uh, and uh, thank you for the very interesting questions. Uh, we covered uh, just about all the territory we we're looking to. Matt, you take control. I don't have control. <laughs> Thank you.